and then hit it again. Stabilize it automatically. We're now recording. This is uh, September the uh, 12th. We're in Jacksonville, Florida, at the home of uh, Jack and uh, Betty Dimitri. And uh, my name is Fred Nijem. And I'm going to ask uh, Uncle Buster some questions. And uh, he's going to respond. And we're going to get a little history here tonight. So let's begin. Uh, Uncle Buster, what are your earliest mem memories of growing up in uh, Tallahassee, either on Lafayette Street or College Avenue? Well, you know, I was born at uh, 217 East Lafayette Street, which is one block from the Capitol. And during the early part of the war, my mother and father bought a house on College Avenue. And while most of the kids were gone, uh, we moved into that house on College Avenue. So I, it was during the early part of the war that we moved over there. Uh, or I should say midway through the war, World War II, 1943 or four. Um, and you know, it was a, that was basically the home that I really remembered because uh, I was old enough then to, to know everything that was going on and everything that was going on with the war effort. And so College Avenue was really, really the house that I, I considered I grew up in. Who lived, who was at College Avenue house? You and Jidney and City, was anybody else living there? Uh, no, because uh, my sister Josephine, your mother, mm -hmm. was already married and had moved to Valdosta, Georgia. And Aunt Tootsie, uh, Aunt Tootsie had finished high school and was going to then Florida State Teachers College for Women in her first year, and I think she had just finished, hadn't finished college, but had, and I'm trying to remember during the war effort, I think, Freddie, she, she we, had, we had not moved to College Avenue before she had, she had finished school. She, she didn't finish college, but it, but it had taken a couple of years in college. And I don't remember whether Aunt Tootsie actually lived on College Avenue or still at 217 East Lafayette. What, what are your memories of, uh, of Uncle Joe and Big Ma, Uncle Mitchell, and some uh, of the other? You know, Uncle Joe was, uh, in 1940, had the stroke. Uh, he and my father and Uncle Mitchell ran the business. And when he had a stroke, Tallahassee Grocery Company. Tallahassee Grocery Company. He was uh, bedridden from that point on. In fact, he was bedridden from 1940 when he had the stroke, or early part of 41 to uh, 1946 when he died. But um, he that left the business being run by my father and Uncle Mitchell. And I can remember every night uh, my dad would come home and after eating go up to the College Avenue house that Uncle Joe lived in, which was at the right at the university, the gates of the university, mm -hmm. and sit with my uncle. And we had many nights would go up there and spend the evening up there. Was um, was Uncle Joe's? Uh... His facilities were good, but he couldn't. It was, he was handicapped with the stroke. Mine was good, but he was handicapped with the stroke. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it gave him a little bit of a speech impediment. Mm -hmm. um, what other uh, reminiscences do you have about the uh, family there as you grew up in Tallahassee uh, with uh, some of the Deeb family? Well, you know, first on the Dimitri side, my dad and mother were the only two of the three brothers there that had any children. Um, so I was sort of raised with three fathers, and Uncle Mitchell wasn't, didn't get married until after the war, and two mothers, Big Ma and Mom. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I went to Florida State Teachers College, uh, the administration school, that's where I did my grammar school and high school, early part of my high school. Uh, I used to eat every day at lunch with Big Ma. I would walk up to the house, because it was close to the 
Was that school on the what is now the well, FSU what is campus? Now FSU's campus. Mm -hmm. I would walk up there and have my lunch and then go back to school. So basically, the uh, you know I, I ate with Uncle Joe and Uncle Mitchell and Big Ma at lunch every day. Um, being the only dad, having the only children, I literally was raised with three fathers. If I wanted my allowance, I'd ask the first one I got to on Monday where to get, be giving me my allowance. Mm -hmm. It was like being raised with three dads. And if I did something wrong, I knew I was going to get it in three ways. And that, that, all, that happened quite often. <laughs> what uh, interaction did y'all have with the Deeb side of the family? Well, my mother was a Deeb. And Freddie, you have to understand, in Tallahassee, all the Lebanese or, and or Syrian people there were all married, all family. Everybody in the town was kin of mm -hmm. the Lebanese families, the Lebanese Syrian families. Uh, we were raised together as one family. I regarded my cousins just like my brothers and sisters. We were literally raised as one family, even though there were five or six different households. It was really one family. Uh, the Deebs were my first cousins on the Deebs on my mother's side, and Arthur Dimitri and Jack E. Dimitri were my cousins on my father's side. Uh, and that was Uncle Abe's children who did not live in Tallahassee, but lived in Greensboro, North Carolina. He was a cobbler, a shoemaker. Mm -hmm. uh, so I regarded all the Deebs, Charlie's side, the whole group, George, all of them were first cousins, and they were just like my brothers and sisters. Hmm. We were literally raised together. Well, we, what, we stayed together, hung together, partied together. What, uh, as you look back on that extended family that was so close, uh, uh, do you think about any advantages that there were to that oh, yes. being raised in that situation? Oh, yes. It taught you to share. Uh, you know, I often wonder when you are the only child in a family, it's very hard to learn to share. Mm -hmm. It taught you to that you had, there was a lot of love. I have to tell you that. If you had a problem, it was everybody's problem. If you had a good time, it was everybody's good time. And the... It, it taught us to, to share and that we, we, we literally lived as a, as a single family. Mm -hmm. Now, the older ones, like my father and Uncle Joe and Uncle Yace, who were on my mother's side, her two brothers. Yes, there was, the, the older ones probably had a little bit of, had, uh, challenge each other to a certain degree. But when it came time to issues, of importance to the family, it was one group. Everybody consolidated. If one person was in trouble, they all of them were in trouble. If one person needed something, everybody stepped up. I re some of my earliest remembrances of uh, going over to Tallahassee was uh, uh, all of the family gathering, if not for meals, but on Sunday evenings, they would all come together that, that's correct. And and they'd spend the whole evening talking. I mean, it that was... and playing Basra. Mm -hmm. The older ones would play cards, yeah. which was Basra. And you, you had no television in those days. All mm -hmm. you had was a radio, if it worked half the time. And consequently, family gatherings was the entertainment. You didn't have the use of everybody standing at their home and watching TV sets or listening to the radio, they came together and played cards and talked and enjoyed each other. And that was, I, I, that's a big, I guess that's something that we really miss in this nation today. Because everybody has their own entertainment center in their house. Mm -hmm. They don't get out now and share experiences together. Mm -hmm. um, so you, um I went to school there at uh, in high school. Uh, what did you do after high school? Well, before I went, before I graduated from high school, the war was on, as you know. Both my brothers, Joe and Bill, were overseas. Bill was in the European theater. Joe was in the Pacific. Both pilots. 
I had taken a course at the after high school on how to rebuild aircraft engines. It was a technical school, and I would after I left high school in the afternoon, I was going to a technical school. They were trying to build the B-29 in Marietta, Georgia. The big B-29 plant was there. It was a Boeing plant, but it was being built under a Bell contract. They were in desperate need of people that understood anything about aircraft engines or airplanes, period. Uh, a hiring agent came to Tallahassee and told my father, you know, we need your son up there. I was 17 in 11th grade. He said, we need him to come to, to Georgia, to Atlanta. And what, what year was that? Uh, 19 for the first part of, uh, it was the last part of 44, the first part of 45. The B-29 was very much needed in the Pacific Theater. My father had told them, you know, my, both the sons are overseas. But they finally convinced him to let me go up there and go to work at the Bell plant. So I left 11th grade and went to Atlanta, Georgia, Marietta, Georgia. Lived in a room with five other men. Each of us had a cot. We'd go in the plant, you know, in the early mornings of the hour, early morning hours, and work the whole day. And I worked on the building of the B-29. I was setting aircraft and props on the aircraft engines. And I did that, and when Roosevelt died, I was still working in the plant then at that time. And when I came home in May... That was a civilian job. It was a civilian job, but it was for Bell Aircraft Corporation. And we were rolling a, a, a plane out on every shift. I mean, it was very, very mm. important. 25,000 workers in the plant. Um, I came home for the May party, called to see the family, my mother and father. And believe it or not, I was sitting on the bleachers at the May Day thing in Tallahassee, and the bleachers collapsed, and it broke the back of my leg, hmm. right above the ankle. So I did not go back to work. I had to stay in bed. And that Summer, you know, the summer vacation came, and the following September, then I enrolled back in high school to get my my degree, and that's when I went back in September '45 and graduated from high school in 19 September '46. Did you suffer I mean, any permanent injury? Any permanent injury from that fall? No, it <clears throat> broke the bone and it healed, mm -hmm. and no permanent injury. But there's a scar where they had to put it together. So after you got your high school degree, then what? What did you do then? Uh, I got my high school degree, and I immediately, like everybody else, had to go into service. This was in July. Of, I went in in July of 1946 and stayed in until 47. And then they let me, I came out and went to college at FSU. The draft was still in effect. The draft you? was still in effect. You had mm -hmm. to go. So I went to college uh, and at FSU, and then I transferred from there to University of Florida to get my law degree, and I graduated in February of 52. Of you studied pre-law at FSU? Yeah, pre-law at FSU. I got my law degree at the University of Florida. And I graduated in February of 52 and out for basically four months. And because I had been less than a year in the military when they let me out the first time, I had to go back into the service, but they gave me a direct commission through the Air National Guard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I became a, went in back in as a lieutenant, and I requested pilot training, and that's where I was trained as an Air Force pilot. And I got came back off of active duty at the end of 1953. Was that the Army Air Force or the, uh, it was the, it was, or the Air Force? You know, the Truman had just changed it to the Air, U.S. Mm -hmm. Air Force. Now, um, I know that you went over to Valdosta. Uh, I spent a lot of summers in Dallas. Yeah, uh, yeah. My mom and dad were uh, married in 40 and 39. 40. 1940? I think it was 1940. Okay. Mm -hmm. You were born in 1942, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I think it was 1940. Tell me a little bit about, you were how old? When, well, you would have been, what, 15 or 16 when you started going over there? About for the summer. Oh, yeah, I would uh, went over right after your mother moved off of Morgan Street over to Troop Street. Right. 
when Fred built the house. In fact, I was there when they started digging the thing. Mm -hmm. I went, we, and you know, it was only 80, 79 miles from Tallahassee. So mother and dad, and we drove over there a lot, you know, on a Sunday. But um, after she moved into the house on Troop Street, I would go over in the summertime and spend as much as a couple of weeks of time. Mm -hmm. In fact, so much so that, you know, I used to sleepwalk when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I would walk in my uh, in my sleep. And yeah. my dad would bar the door with a great big chair, the front door to keep me from going to the front yard. Uh, and so you were there when I was born. Absolutely, I was there when you were born. In fact, I was there. Uh, Fred, your dad had a old motor, motor scooter, mm -hmm. and George LaHood and I used to fight over who was going to ride the motor scooter. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was there when you were born, absolutely. Well, getting back then, you finished uh, you, you finished law school in 1952, University of February of 52, went right into the service again. And, and got came out and got a law degree, and, well, I had already graduated with a law degree. I went right into the Air Force and became an Air Force pilot. You came and out, did you take I, the bar I, exam before you went into the service? I, we didn't. If you graduated from the University of Florida Law School, then you did not have to take the Florida bar exam. Mm -hmm. I was automatically admitted to the bar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, when I went on active duty, I stayed on active duty from the middle of 53 to uh, 52, last of 53. Went through pilot training, came back to the Air National Squadron in Jacksonville, and flew for them until 1957 on the weekends. Uh, when I came when I came out, Uncle Bill offered me a job. If he said you can go to work in a law firm or you can go to work, you go to work with me, and that's when I decided I'd go to work with Uncle Bill. Uh, what kind of planes were you flying when you were flying in the Air Force? When I first came in, back from the Guard Squadron, uh, well, I first of all got my wings in Navy jets. And then I came back to the guard squadron. They were flying P-51s in. Mm -hmm. So I learned. I flew the H model P-51, and then we got F-80 jets in in the guard squadron. And we transitioned from the P-51s to jets, and then we got F-86s. And I left the squadron when they had F-86s. Mm -hmm. uh, you kept up your pilot's license. Oh yeah, we could too. We, Uncle Bill and I and Joe, all of us being pilots, all pretty much had an airplane around all the time. Some kind of airplane. I even had an air coupe when I was going to law school, because I had learned to fly long before I went in the service. As you know, when we lived in Tallahassee, I helped the little guy that had the Piper Cup dealership. Mm -hmm. uh, made a little grass strip that he had, and I learned to fly, and I soloed uh, when I was 16. I soloed, in fact, I was 15, 15 mm -hmm. to 16. I didn't realize Uncle Joe was a pilot. I thought he was a Navy man on a ship. No, he was a, he was a, he flew PBMs. He was a naval pilot. He was a naval pilot. He was trained at Pensacola. After he left on the academy, they sent him straight to Pensacola, and he got his wings. And he picked up pilots during the war with in the um, uh, Pacific. Pacific for the PBMs. PBM standing for what? Pilots missing in action. No, something. No, it was it was. They were the flying boats. I in see. fact, he trained right in that river, right down there at the Naval Air Station. After he got his wings, they sent him to Jacksonville, and they taught him to fly. The, the airboats right out of this river. In fact, he had a crash right out in this river on takeoff one day. Where were you when uh, when Uncle Bill had his? Uh, was he shot down only once? Uh, was he lost two airplanes. Not shot down. He one the props ran away on the B-26 after takeoff, and they barely landed or crashed a few miles from the field with a full load of bombs, full load of guns. But the plane did not explode, and all of them got out alive. Is that the one in which he pulled the? the he other pulled man? the he pulled the enlisted man out, which was his radio man. Mm -hmm. That's when he got the soldier. Uh, Where were you at that time? Were you? I was forty-four. You were. No, I was still in school. Mm -hmm. I was before I went to the bomber plant. 
uh, then the second plane that we lost, flying back off of the mission, the flak hit the airplane, blew most of the, as I understand it, blew most of the windshield out, and they got the airplane back, but he was cut pretty badly. So he was sent to uh, the Isle of Capri for rehabilitation for recouping, and that's where he flew 65 missions and then was uh, allowed to come home. The reason for 65 missions because he was flying medium bombers. Their flights were much shorter than the flying fortresses who only had to do 25 missions. But hour-wise, they were probably the equivalent. How did, uh, how did the family back in Tallahassee, they, they knew about all of it? Or did they, his... Uh, oh, yeah, we were told he was wounded. Mm -hmm, and all that. How did... <laughs> sit in there and take that. <laughs> not very well. <laughs> <laughs> As the understatement. Yeah. yeah. Not very I imagine well. there was a lot of rosaries being said. She went to yeah. Mass. Uh, she went to Mass every morning. And she couldn't drive a car. But uh, she would put it in first gear. And go all the way to church in first gear. Because oh, she didn't know how to shift the gears. It went to 6.30 mass. I, I remember being in the car with some of that. She put it in first gear. I went all the way there and came all the way back and never got out of first gear. That old green Plymouth. Thing. Yeah. Well. That's every one. Yeah. Um. Well, after you got out of the service, and you, you continued to visit Valdosta. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Let me tell you, your, your mother was like a second mother to me. Josephine, I was real close to her. Mm -hmm. She, uh, more so than Tootsie, because Tootsie was younger. Yeah, mother was older. And your mother, uh, I was there when you, everything happened to the family. Mm -hmm. You know, she was, and your dad treated me just like another son. Mm -hmm. the, uh, well, you... Were good times. So you, you started uh, in business here with Uncle Bill. Uh, who else was in business with him at that time? Uncle Jack and Dimitri in the beginning, but they... They uh, separated their interest in the first part of 1960. Mm -hmm. I was working for the two of them. Uh, and they said they divided their interest in 1963, 62, 63, when Uncle Bill had to move to Orlando. That's when they divided up the interest, and I stayed with Uncle Bill working for him. And you know, Freddie, I didn't. I wasn't a partner in 1995. He and I, I worked for him. I was just a for Bill. I, I was a salaried employee, like everybody. Were you doing legal work? Or were you into construction? No, no. I ran the. I ran this office because he was an owner, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I ran all the books and all the bookkeeping and all, all the accounting and all the bills were paid from up here. After he and Jack divided up, everything was done up here. Mm -hmm. uh, I. Um, I ran the office end of it, as well as the construction up here, and he just took care of the construction down there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't become a... He and I bought a piece of real estate together in the mid-60s. That's how Dimitri Enterprises came into existence. He and I were 50-50 in the Dimitri Enterprise operation, which was a partnership between he and I. But I worked for the construction company. I was a salaried employee until Prior 1975. To that. Prior to that. That's when we formed Dimitri Industries. And he and I both then own, mm -hmm. we stopped building in Dimitri Builders and started building in Dimitri Industries. Mm -hmm. 1965. I didn't 1975. 75. I didn't realize it. I worked for them for thir 12 years as an employee. Yeah. But we were partners in the real estate side of it. Now, I remember, uh, I remember Aunt Zira. What, what, where did she live over there on the... Uh, what street was she on? In Tallahassee. Yeah. yeah. She lived on Jefferson Street, mm -hmm. right next to Aunt Effie. Aunt Effie was in one house, she okay. was in the other. Yeah. Aunt Effie owned both houses, but Aunt Nazira lived in the house. Now, was Aunt Effie the first to move to Jacksonville Beach? 
Did she move before mm, Sitti and Jitty no, did? No, I think Sitti did. Mm -hmm. Sitti moved first. Sitti and Jitty moved first to Jacksonville Beach because after I came out of the service and came here, there was nobody left in Tallahassee. Right. So we built a house at the beach for Uncle Bill, built a house for Mother and Dad at the beach in the early part of the 50s. Oh, it was that long ago, huh? Oh, yeah. And they lived there until Jiddy died in 1960. Yeah. Yeah, they'd been living there five years at least. Did uh, did you all add the apartment on Aunt Effie after the house was built? No, for Aunt Nazira. Aunt Nazira. No, it was built with that apartment on there. I mean, she was brought there with mother and dad, and mother brought her there with her. Yeah. She was there from the time the house was finished. It was built just for her, a bedroom, a little kitchen, and her own bathroom. I remember the apartment. Then Aunt Effie moved later. Yeah, and, and she moved and she bought the little house up the street, you know, about a yeah. block away. Yeah. Because Rose was. Now, Aunt Effie's family, George and, and Johnny and, and uh, Rose, Rose and Blaine. And Ferris and Frida. Ferris and Frida. Ferris. By the first marriage. By the first marriage. Frida had been long in Douglas, Georgia. Yes, she was. Ferris lived here. Yeah. And he also, Uncle Bill and Jack, put him in the construction business. I remember that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he died here with, you know, he had a family here. Are Johnny and George still living? Johnny is living, he's in a nursing home. Okay. George has just lost his wife. Mm -hmm. She died from cancer, Marie. And he's like a recluse. We, he, he didn't even announce it in the paper that she had died. Rose gets on him all the time. Uh, I haven't seen him in 15 years. But you keep up with Rose and... Uh, well, I told Rose and Blanche and I talk all the time, all the time together yeah. and go to Tallahassee. I see them. Rose and I go over for the different functions, but... Were, were you as close to them as, as you were to... Rose was like a sister to me. It was Rose yeah. and Blanche. Yeah. Literally real close. We were close together because they were my age. Mm -hmm. I Rose is two months older than me, and we all we graduated together in school. Yeah, uh, I know Aunt Effie liked to fish. And Did she ever? <laughs> was an outdoor. And floated her inner tube. She'd go down to that beach with that inner tube, yeah. and needless to say, she was quite large. And she sat in the middle of that inner tube, <laughs> and it was like a boat floating. <laughs> Her my stomach would be above it. <laughs> She'd lay in that water like this, Freddie, literally, and just float with the tide. <laughs> yeah. Um, we should remark here that we have uh, Aunt Betty and Tammy at this table here. So here's some. Excess noise. You hear corrections and criticisms. That's where we're getting it from. Now, you, I was I was talking to you earlier about your early days of meeting Aunt Betty and getting married and starting your own family. Um, go through that briefly. Y'all met where in Vicksburg? No, I had um, Joe Navy here in town. He and Betty named me. Betty named me is from Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. And Joe married Betty Namey. And Betty Namey wanted me to meet Betty Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so one Christmas, when they were going out for the Christmas holidays, Joe said, you come on out there. Betty wants you to meet, Betty Namey wants you to meet uh, his wife, meet Betty Abraham. So I decided that was in the Christmas of 53. I'd just gotten off of active duty. We go out there. Well, that was the year they had the horrible tornado in Vicksburg. It killed some 32 people. So they called off the big party that would normally, they normally had at uh, Christmas party. At New the New Year's, Year's party. It was a New Year's party. Mm -hmm. And that's when all of them got together and that all of the Mississippi area would come to Vicksburg for a big dance. So she left after the tornado and left and went to Tyler, Texas to visit with uh, brother's family, mm -hmm. a brother's wife. 
So I didn't get to meet her. Hmm. So we, we came back to Jacksonville after the, we spent the New Year's out there and came back to Jacksonville. The following July is when they have the Syrian Lebanese Convention. Six months later. Yeah, six months later. So I, it was in New Orleans, and at that point we had a Beechcraft airplane, Bill, Uncle Bill and the company. And I took the Beechcraft and flew out to New Orleans for the, uh, had George Elo with me and Knight of Missouri. He, God rest his soul, he's now dead. And we flew to Vicksburg. When I walked into the Jung Hotel, uh, Joe Namie's sister-in-law was standing there talking to Betty. And I'm, I, her name was Dolly. And I walked up and said, Dolly, how are you? Good to meet you. She says, I want you to meet Betty Abraham. And I said, well, I finally met you. I went to Vicksburg and didn't meet you. So that's how I met her. I met her in the lobby of the Jung Hotel. And I had a cousin of mine that was at the convention. She and her husband, and she comes walking through an hour later. Says, "When are you're 28, when in the hell are you gonna get married?" I says, "I've just met the girl I'm gonna marry." So, yeah, did, did Aunt Betty hear you say that, or is that that was a private? I, I told her that night. I said, "Yep, I'm gonna get married." Mm -hmm. I asked her when I met her with Dolly. I said, I'm, I haven't eaten anything. I'm gonna go over down to the well, cross street from the cross street from the um, Roosevelt Hotel to the oyster bar. Oyster bar. So I'm going down to get oysters. So she walked down there with me, and I told her that night. I said, Well, I met the girl I'm gonna marry. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, Thirteen months later, we got married. Fourteen months later, and we were all in the wedding. And the good part about that was Uncle Sam really made it possible. Vicksburg was a long drive. But I had to fly for the guard anyway, and we had P-51s. I could go out there and get in that, I'd take a P-51, you know, would do 400 miles an hour, 375 miles an hour. I'd get in that P-51 and take me an hour to get to Vicksburg, hour and 15, 20 minutes. Not to Vicksburg, to Jackson. Air National Guard Station in Jackson. So I would fly to that station, she'd drive over to Jackson and pick me up. So Uncle Sam made it possible. It's funny, I got doing it. So. That was a long distance romance. <laughs> yeah. Made possible by Uncle Sam. Huh? Would have happened otherwise? No, because it was too hard to get to. That was a long drive then on those two lane roads. Aunt Betty, we what just heard like his that. version of this, is that correct? It's pretty true. Uh -huh. Did you feel the same way he did, that that was the girl for me? Did you think well, this was, was the guy was for me? He was fun, and mm. we would argue, which we're still doing, <laughs> right to the end, and uh, never got mad, you know. He was, mm. he was challenging, he was. But I wasn't sure you know, it was... Well, uh, she had somebody else chasing her at the time, a doctor, and that's who her dad wanted her to marry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't say that. He just said he didn't think Jack was the right one for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, Daddy, he's different from us, and I'm going to tell you, that guy won't ever settle down, and he yeah. was right. He never had settled down. <laughs> so... Oh. Says he's a pilot and all that. He's never going to settle But here that. I am, yeah. 50 years later. 51? Still 51 here. 51 years later. 51 years we later. weathered the storm. We never really had a we never had a storm. hard time making it. We, we had did. a little rain every now and then, but never a storm. As long as he did what I told him to do, <laughs> things were fine. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so. You heard it, didn't you, Dad? True. You needed a mother. Oh God, let's not. We are I still recording it. Yeah, we got it. Now. Um, you can back that up if you want. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. Um, so you've had five children, and uh, twelve grandchildren. Twelve grandchildren. What is uh, what is the thing you're most 
uh, both of you, each of you, both thankful for when you think about your children and, uh, and the family you've had? Well, I, I can tell you very simply with me. In the day and age that we live in, we have uh, four of them married. Lisa, the oldest girl, is not married, engaged, but never married. And the thing that I'm not most thankful for, but I'm proudest of, is the fact that they're four successful marriages. We haven't had the problem of worrying what's going to happen when they get a divorce, what's going to happen with the grandchildren. Who's going to look after them? Thank God they were all good enough and smart enough. They married good, married, you know, they, they couldn't have married any, any better. Each, each spouse fit the person they married. And that's what I'm most proud of. It's not the business. It's not any of that. We could have, over, we could have worked through all of that. It's not having to face the divorces within the family and worry about going to happen with your grandchildren who's going to end up how who's going to take them where are they going yeah All right, that's, that's baby, what what are you thankful for when you think about your children and grandchildren that each one of them is different and yet they are different each one of them but what i'm most thankful for they, they are very healthy and they're happy and they're they're really great adults. They grew up great with us, but mm -hmm. after they left us, they proved what we thought was there. And Good way to put it. they followed the church. And they still love us, and they still want to be with us once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and they, their church is very important to them. And they've raised their children that way, so mm -hmm. we're proud of that. Well, that, that was another question I, I was going to ask you since you brought it up. What what role in your personal life and in your family has the church and your faith played in your life, in your lives? Big that, role. Big role. It's probably the strength of our marriage. It's like, uh, it's like having a you can depend on. Mm -hmm. if you have a problem and we did stuff so it was routine and it was the way it would be but we didn't stuff it down their throats and they learned to like it that way I guess well, whatever it was we were lucky we tried to do it and we were lucky and I answer it this way um, we were given the kids by the Lord's will. The only way to teach them is by example. And I've told you that before. The I've always said that they've got they got to take care of their own souls. I can't do it for them. Their mother can't do it. But it's our obligation to set an example for them to take care of. And the family unit is everything. Every country that's ever it existed and been successful. It was always built on strong family units. So it was our responsibility to keep a strong family unit. And and instill in them that the family is the second most important thing in their life. Their soul is their first, naturally. And then their work ethic. You do that by example. You, you have to have, if you have to get up and go to work, you might as well make it produce all it can produce. And then hopefully, when they've done that, they'll be successful. They'll find <clears throat> a gift to the community. And that's the example I set, and that's the example she's tried to set. So that, uh, and you can only do that by, you have to do it in order for them to believe it. I want to say something. They had us. They had each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. And still have each other. They're... It's a, it's a camaraderie that they shared since they were little bitty kids. And maybe it was because they were so close in age. Or the other thing I think is that they've learned to respect each one of them for what they 
can be or can do. And they have. Mark's sort of been the head of the party. Jay's the one that everybody goes to when anything. Lisa pulls it all together. She is a sweetheart that gets to each one of them. And Christopher, <laughs> Christopher is an experience <laughs> that they all so they, love. So they each have different gifts. They do. And uh, it, those gifts, strengths. Making sure that each of them understand each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've been lucky there. We have a lot. Uncle Basta, um, your business, uh, you success is business, that. and I, we've talked about this before. Uh, what, what foundation did your, uh, did your growing up and your family have? in contributing to your success as a business person and in your own family. What, what, as you look back on your... Is that looking at me? Yeah. Freddie, let me say it this way. We each learned from somebody behind us. My mentor was Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill's mentor was Side Deeb. Side Deeb's mentor was George Deeb. They taught us the ethic and Side Deeb Strong, hard businessman, but absolutely ethical. Would never cheat. Would never do anything to cheat anybody out of you. He taught Uncle Bill that this is the way you do. Your word is your. When you shake hands, that's it. Uncle Bill that handed that down to me. We, I can truthfully tell you, never, ever take advantage of a subcontractor. Or someone working for, them. if anything, go backwards to make sure they get a more than a fair share. That's the end, and that's what I tried to hand down to my kids. You don't have to cut it to the close. You don't have to cheat. You don't have. If you just simply use your brains and be honorable with everybody, you're going to be successful. If you work hard, you're going to work hard. But you. The, it's the ethics and business that they taught me that was handed down from George Deeb to Side Deeb to me. My dad were out of business by the time I got old enough to realize business. So I learned from my brother. He learned from his first cousin. He learned, first cousin learned from his brother. And that's what I've tried to hand down to Jay and all of them. When you shake your hand, it's your hand. Yeah, and... Uh... A lot of that you got uh, from your extended family as you grew That's up. That's right. And and I know faith was an important and religion was an important part of that uh, community there in Tallahassee as you Absolutely. all grew up. Absolutely. You have to realize the Catholic community in Tallahassee was very small. A big piece of it was made up with the Lebanese Syrian people of Lebanese Syrian extraction. Uh, the little That's church could. It was, a, you know, being a Catholic in Tallahassee, Florida, when I grew up, was uh, <laughs> not the best thing in the world. Not the best thing in the world to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Uncle Buster. Now, I guess just uh, is there any any other remembrances or uh, lessons that you've learned or any final I'll, I'll thoughts say this. you'd like to add? I'll, I'll finish it by saying this. You think about your first cousins. Mm -hmm. You think about your brothers and your sisters. Not sisters, your brothers. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the rest of our family, brothers and sisters. Okay. For a family the size of ours, something the elders ahead of us must have taught us right. Because nobody's ever really been in any kind of trouble, you know, in in their business, in their faith, everything. We, I don't know how to say this. Well, it's, we've been successful at life. In life, in that's, the I things guess that the important thing. that matter the that most. That matter the most. That's exactly right. Think how strong our family today. You're sitting here. You know, you're a, a nephew that's. Uh, 64 years old, just sitting here with an uncle. Yeah. I mean, we still do all those things together. Yeah. Some was, of them not as good as others, but. <laughs> yeah, 
it, it, there was a there was a sense of family and character given to us that has lasted and has made us what we are today. You know, I watched my father stay in business for years with his brothers, and it was just a natural thing for us to do the same. Mm -hmm. You know, when he, we put the trust together for the children, in which I was privileged to run and handle, uh, you know, it was done for the good of the family. Mm -hmm. um, if I died tomorrow, Freddie, it's been a full life, full, full life. And thank God I, I know where the children are going, the way they're headed. Their faith is, they're very strong in their faith. They're good parents. Uh, and I have no doubt that they'll hit, you know, that they will live their lives setting an example for their youngsters as I've, as I've tried to do for them. The things that you were given will continue on That's right. in your children's children. Okay, Uncle Buster, you did a good job, and we got just over 46 minutes of tape. I don't know how interesting it's going to be for anybody.